morning and welcome to this service of worship. Thank you for being here today and be sure to sign your attendance pads so we'll have a record of your being here today. Uh, while you do, I'll just lift up a few announcements. Um, you'll read on the front of the bulletin that this past Wednesday night we officially adopted our new church bylaws and so thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your prayers and your support in that and your diligence and patience as we try to move forward together. So this is an exciting time and uh, you read there that Mr. Steve Butler has been elected as the new uh, interim chair of our new church council. So he and I will be meeting to start to put together a nominations report and then we'll have a meeting in the fall, a church meeting to officially adopt uh, new leadership for the church. So please continue to be in prayer about that, but thank goodness we've got that uh, accomplished and now we can continue to move forward together. We've got exciting a uh, couple of Wednesday nights coming up, so I invite you to come back the next two Wednesday nights. This Wednesday night, our St. Luke's School will be giving us a preview of their spring musical, The Wizard of Oz. That'll be in the Ministry Center. We'll have supper at 5.30, and then they'll give us a preview of their musical at 6.15. So I hope you can come and be a part of that. If you've never seen one of our St. Luke School musicals, please come and see that. They are so well done. You will be amazed at how uh, professional they are. So come Wednesday night and see a preview and then come back Friday or Saturday night for the actual performances. Then the next Wednesday night, May the 1st, our St. Luke Orchestra will be presenting their spring concert. They're going to be giving us music from Fiddler on the Roof, so that should be a fun night. So we'll again have supper at 5.30 and uh, the performance by the St. Luke Orchestra at 6.15 uh, on Wednesday, May the 1st. So exciting Wednesday night's coming up. And then I uh, want to also just remind you and make you aware that the funeral service for Mr. Andy Marks will be this coming Saturday morning, Saturday at 10 a.m. here in the sanctuary. We'll have the service of remembrance and celebration for Andy, and then the family will greet everyone following the service in Stockwell Hall. So I hope you can be here this Saturday morning at 10 as we celebrate Andy's life. Let me offer a word of prayer now as we continue in worship. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of coming into your house today. We thank you for the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that you would come now and fill our hearts and our minds. You are the reason we are here, Lord Jesus. We are seeking to worship you. So fill us and empower us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Please turn in your hymnals to number 57. Number 57, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And you're invited to stand as we sing together.
Please join with me as we say together our affirmation of faith as printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
If you would, bow your heads with me and let us go to God in prayer together. Gracious God, we come before you with hearts and souls stirred by that incredible song with some of the most powerful lyrics in the history of hymnody. Lyrics that remind us that what we have in you, no matter what our circumstances, cannot be taken away. Lord, what you have is more powerful. What you offer is of eternal value. And Lord, it is so good to be reminded that the joy that is found in you is not dependent upon our circumstances or what else is going on around us, Lord but by a relationship that is forged by victory over sin and death. Lord, even though it's been a few weeks, may we still be reminded once more that we are an Easter people, that we celebrate and we serve a resurrected Lord. And this hymn was a wonderful, the song, a wonderful reminder of that. Gracious God, thank you that you did for us what we could not do for ourselves, that you paid a debt you didn't owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. And you did it willingly, and you did it lovingly, and you did it for all people for all eternity. Lord, we remember this day those who could not be with us. And Lord, we just ask a special anointing on them Lord, we ask a special um, portion of you and your presence that provides peace and strength and healing and hope. Lord, help them to know that they may not be with us physically, Lord, but they are still with us in spirit and that they are loved and valued and remembered as we love our family. And so, Lord, as we seek to be your hands and feet, wherever we may find ourselves, Lord, may we let your light shine in and through us. May we cast aside ourselves and our good intentions, Lord, for your perfect will. Lord, there are so many things for which we are grateful and so many things which are stir our hearts towards you even now. And for those things that have been spoken and those unspoken, Lord, we lift them up to you. And we know that you hear them and we know even now that you're moving in and through them. And we give you thanks as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Now we'd like to invite our children to come forward as Miss Nicole has something she'd like to share with you this morning. Good morning. As we wait for the children to come forward, I want to remind uh, parents about extreme kids tonight, third through fifth grade. If it rains, if it's a drizzle, we will still have it. But if we have a thunderstorm, we will reschedule. Good morning. How are you all? Good. Well, this week we're talking about, or all month long, we're talking about patience. And last time we were here, we talked about waiting well. And I personally struggle with this. I do not wait well. But today, 
in our lesson, we will be talking about, and I know you all will probably remember this story very well, about one of the classic examples of someone who didn't wait well, and it was a group of people, and it was the Israelites. So you remember, they left Egypt. God rescued them. It was amazing. Pharaoh was destroyed. The sea was parted, and then Pharaoh was destroyed. They get to the wilderness, and what do they do when Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments? Do you remember? They made a golden calf to worship. You remember that? Yes. So Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments from God. God's presence is there. They can see it. And Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments. And while they're waiting, they can't wait well, right? And so they make an idol. And Moses comes down and finds out they have done this. And, and it, when we read the story, aren't we like, how could you do that? It's so obvious that you just should have waited, right? Well, when we're in it, it's really hard to see that because there are lots of times where I know I'm not waiting well. What about you guys? So we're going to be talking, deep diving more into that today. And we're going to be asking God to help us in our waiting. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for our church family, God, and thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord, please help us to be patient. Please help us all in the waiting to seek you and to wait well. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Please turn in your hymnals to number 128. Number 128, he leadeth me, O blessed thought, and you're invited to stand as we sing together.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we do seek to be led by you. And sometimes we don't follow well and sometimes we don't wait well. But Lord, we do always and forever need your guidance and your spirit. So strengthen us this day and take what is given and use it to further glorify and honor your kingdom above all others in Christ's name. Amen. Our scripture focus this morning is from Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by many things. 
the preparations that had to be made. She came to Jesus and she asked him, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, Jesus answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one thing. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. You may be seated. And let us pray. Almighty God, thank you for these stories of our faith. Lord Jesus, this is your life story. And we are so privileged to be able to read these accounts of all that you did and the things that you said and the things that you taught while you were on this earth. And so I pray, Lord Jesus, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would come and teach us what we need to learn and to hear in this modern world and give us the courage to apply it to our lives. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Well, you may be familiar with the term method acting. Method actors spend months, sometimes years, studying the person that they are going to portray on the camera or on the stage. Method actors will spend months, sometimes years, studying a person's mannerisms, They study the way the person walks. They study their hand gestures. They study the way they sit down, the way they stand up. They study their facial expressions. They study their voice inflection and the way they speak. They try to study every little minute detail about the person. And then the hard work begins. After a method actor has spent months sometimes years trying to mimic and study a person's every mannerism, then they start to ask questions like, what motivates this person? What makes this person cry? What makes this person laugh? What makes this person angry? What challenges this person? Does this person have faith or not? So a method actor then begins to ask mental questions of the person they are going to portray, and then they take all of those physical attributes and all of those mental attributes, and they literally try to internalize all that they've learned in order to become the person that they are going to portray. Daniel Day-Lewis is a famous method actor. And in 2013, Daniel Day-Lewis was given the Best Actor Award for becoming Abraham Lincoln on the screen for us. And when he was asked, what motivates you to do this? How can you spend all of this time studying the person you're going to portray? Daniel Day-Lewis said, it is the draw of another person's life that sparks my curiosity. I am drawn to another person's life and that brings creativity and curiosity out in me. Well, I hope that you see where I'm going with this. The bottom line today is there is no greater person, no greater life that we could study and try to emulate than the life of Jesus Christ. There is no greater person that we could try to be like. There's no greater life that we could study and ask questions like, what motivates Jesus in this passage? What makes Jesus laugh or smile in this passage? What breaks Jesus' heart in this passage? What is Jesus trying to teach me as I read this story of his life? We are called to emulate the life of Jesus Christ so that we become more and more like him every day. 
Have you felt the draw of Jesus' life on your life? Are you drawn to study Him? Does it make you curious to know these things about Him? What are you doing about that curiosity? How are you seeking to live more like Him each and every day? There is no greater life that we could study and seek to live than the life of Jesus. And so we come today to this classic passage of Mary and Martha. And in this passage, of course, we read that Martha has opened her home to Jesus. And what a beautiful tribute that she would open her home to the Savior of the world. What a beautiful testimony that she has invited Jesus into her sacred space, her home. But we read, of course, in this classic passage that Martha is tied up trying to get everything ready. She's busy trying to get the house straightened up. She's busy getting the food in the oven. She's busy trying to make everything look neat and tidy for her guest. She's so busy, in fact, that she becomes furious with her sister. Why aren't you doing anything to help me? Don't you know we've got a special guest coming tonight? Get up and do something to help me. But then we hear Jesus saying the words, Mary has chosen the better way. There are few things that really matter, Martha. Actually, there's only one thing that really matters. And, G- and Mary has chosen the better way. Jesus was saying to Martha, don't get bogged down in those details. I'm not worried about the way your house looks. I could care less about that. Just come and sit down and let us get to know each other. Let us spend some time together. Let me teach you my ways. Talk to me. Tell me your story. Tell me the things you're struggling with. And let's spend some time together. Mary has chosen the better way. And so we are called to be drawn to Jesus. Mary was not forced to sit at the feet of Jesus. Mary was not coerced into this. Mary didn't do it to spite her sister, I don't think. Mary was drawn to this man. She was drawn to the Savior of the world. She wanted to know more about Him, and so she sat at His feet, and the Scripture says she listened to Him. She was seeking to absorb knowledge. She was seeking to absorb everything about Him. And she sat at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus said, this is the one thing that really matters. And so, how are we to emulate Mary. How are we to walk more closely with Jesus? Well, let's think about that for a moment today. I think, first of all, we learn from this classic story of Mary and Martha that in order to draw closer to Jesus, we must remove some of the clutter in our lives. Martha's not a bad person. Jesus never says, Martha, you have sinned. You're a terrible person. He merely says, Martha, you're worried about all the wrong things. Don't worry about all of that. And boy, do I sometimes get bogged down in those things. I get bogged down in the little details that don't really matter. When it comes time to prepare a sermon, when it comes time to write a sermon, boy, I can find five or six or seven things around the house that need doing. I go to sit down and I think, well, I might just throw a load of laundry in the washing machine. And then I go and I do that and then I see something else that needs to be done. So I go and I do that and then I go and do something else. And then I sit down, well, I'll play one game on my phone and clear my thoughts. I get bogged down in all the wrong things. And I think that's the point Jesus is making here. Don't worry about all those little things. What I care about is you sitting with me. What I care about is you studying me, you taking the time to spend with me so that I can spend time with you. 
And so when it comes time to prepare a sermon or to work on a sermon, a lot of times what helps me is to straighten up my desk or my workspace, wherever I am. If there's a bunch of papers lying around and piles of things, it helps me to just at least straighten up a little bit and get everything put away so that then the space is clear and I can open the scriptures and think clearly. That may or may not be the case for you, but the point is, what can you remove from the busyness of your schedule in order to make more time to study the life of Jesus? I know you're thinking, gosh, I'm just so busy. My schedule is so full all the time. I get it. I hear you. And I'm guilty of that too. But the point of this is that we make the time, that we remove all the stuff that doesn't matter in order to sit at the feet of Jesus. What things do you need to let go of in your life in order to remove the clutter and make time for Jesus? Oftentimes, it helps me to go for a walk. And when I go for a walk, there have been many times in my life when I've just started to talk to Jesus as though he's walking right beside me. I've started to talk to him as though my best friend were right there with me. And so many times when I've done that, I have felt Jesus speaking back to me. It's never been an audible voice, but I've just felt clarity in my heart clarity in my mind, clarity in my soul in what I might need to be doing next because I feel as though Jesus is speaking directly to me. What is it that you need to do in order to make more intentional time to be with Jesus? Delete some things from your everyday schedule and make time to sit at his feet and then spend that quality time with Jesus. Jesus says there's only one thing that really matters. Sit and hang out with me. We, many years ago, we did the study, the five love languages. You may be familiar with the five love languages. It's a, it's a book and a course that you can take, and it, it really talks about how to live a marriage relationship better and how to love your, your spouse in a better way. And it, it says that there are five ways that we communicate love primarily. Five ways that we communicate love to another person through words of affirmation, through uh, acts of service, through physical touch, through quality time, and through giving of gifts. Those are the five love languages, and the premise is that we tend to give love in the way we want to receive love. So if you are a gift giver and you love to give gifts to other people, it probably means that you really like to receive gifts yourself. It means that you feel loved when you receive gifts. And so thinking about the five love languages, think about all the ways, all the times that Jesus simply sat with people. Think about all the times that Jesus left the crowd to sit with one person or to go after one person. Think about all the times that he sat with those that nobody else wanted to sit with. Think about the times that he hung out with someone when nobody else would talk to them. And I think that says to us that Jesus gives quality time and he wants that quality time from us as well. Make that time to spend with Jesus because he stands ready to spend quality time with you. He wants to have that relationship. He wants to have that time together. Spend time, quality time with him. And then I would say as we seek to study the character and the life of Jesus, allow the Holy Spirit to be your acting coach. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide your heart in how you act and walk this earth. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide you in being more Christ-like. Maybe that's our daily prayer. Lord Jesus, I want to be more like you today. I want to walk more closely with you. I want to respond to my neighbors and my co-workers and my friends and my family in the way that you would respond. 
Lord Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit, help me to take on all of your characteristics. Help me to breathe your breath today. Let your light shine in and through me. Let the Holy Spirit be your guiding force, your acting coach in the world today. And then, finally, once we have studied the character of Jesus, once we have studied his attributes and the way that he lives his life, once we have asked questions like, Jesus, how would you respond? How are you responding here? What motivates you? Then we must apply it to our lives. We must begin to seek to live it out. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of Jesus Christ. When God starts to work on our insides, then our lives begin to reflect that on the outside. It's an invitation for us to join Jesus in His work in the world today. It's an invitation for us to sit at His feet and to learn from him. J.D. Walt is a Christian writer and teacher and preacher today, and he writes these words. He says, the force of the whole New Testament is not to try harder to be a better person or a better Christian. The message of the gospel is to give up on that whole project. That former self must die. Arise into the new creation of your raised from the dead life. Our good to great mentality has to die. And the hidden in Christ reality must begin. He's saying to us, we must let go of our selfish ways in this world. We must let go of the things that make us feel pumped up or make us look better. And we must seek to take on the life, the characteristics, the walk, the talk of Jesus Christ. You may or may not be familiar with the name Scotty Scheffler. If you're not a golf fan, you probably don't know that name. But Scotty Scheffler is a 27-year-old man who won the Masters last Sunday afternoon for the second time. He won the Masters. He is the number one golfer in the world right now, and he is in the lead today to win the Heritage at Hilton Head. So if he goes on to win today, he'll be the first player in 40 years to win a green jacket and a plaid jacket back to back. He is the number one golfer in the world. He just won the Masters for the second time. His wife is about to have their first child any day now. He is literally on top of the world. He's on top of his game. He's got everything in front of him. And last week after the Masters, an interviewer asked Scotty this question. He said, a lot of number one players in the world have had to be selfish with their time. They've had to be compulsive and self-focused in order to stay on top. Where, Scotty, does golf define you right now? And Scotty said, hopefully, golf does not define me. Golf is a selfish sport, but you have to learn how to say no to certain things. Golf is a huge part of my life, but it's just something that I do. Golf does not define me as a person. I am a faithful guy, he says. I believe in one creator God, and I believe in his son, Jesus Christ. Ultimately, that is what defines me. He said, I've been given a huge platform to compete and to show my talent, but it's not about anything that I have done. I have been called to come out here to do my best to compete, but ultimately to glorify God. Now there's a guy who gets it. You could hear the journalists in the background, oh, Jesus Christ, what? But he has studied the life of Christ. He's doing his best to emulate the life of Christ through his humility. And he gets it. And he wasn't afraid to share that on a huge stage to say, 
it's not about anything I've done. Yes, I've been given a great opportunity, and yes, I love to play golf, but it's only so that I can give glory to God on the world stage. He gets what it is to live a life in Jesus Christ. So what defines us is not how successful we are. What defines us is not who we are on the outside or how many accolades we can pile up. The only thing that defines us is our relationship with Jesus Christ and how we seek to live like Him. The amazing thing about method actors is that they will not break character until the project is done. Method actors, when the camera cuts off, they stay in character. When they walk off stage to wait for their next scene, they stay in character. When they're working on a film and they go to their trailer for a few hours, they stay in character. They will not break character. And I think about my walk with Jesus Christ, how often, how easily, how in the split second I can break character. I think how quickly I can begin to walk and talk in a way that is not Christ-like. And so again, the life of Christ calls me, it draws me in to be more like Him with every breath that I take. Jesus is calling us to that one thing that really matters, and that is to sit at His feet, to learn from Him, and to begin to walk and talk like Him. Lord Jesus, come and fill me. Use me. Keep me close to You so that I will not break character, no matter where I am or what I'm doing or who I'm around. I pray that everyone will know that it is only you and me that really matters. Have you got that one thing in your life? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you came into this world to live a life that would show us how to live in our Heavenly Father. And Lord Jesus, forgive us where we so often think that it's about us. Forgive us where we break character from you and we begin to walk in our own ways. Lord Jesus, fill us today. Fill our lives as we humble ourselves before you. May we walk and talk and respond and react only through the power of your Holy Spirit. Draw us into your life, Lord Jesus, so that we will be more like you each and every day. We thank you and we praise you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Please turn in your hymnals to number 545. 545, The Church's One Foundation. And you're invited to stand as we sing together.
Don't be alarmed. Uh, The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. Without Him, we have nothing. So let us go now in the name and the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, today and forevermore.